Good morning, everyone. I begin this session by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the different lands on which we're all meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. I extend that respect to all Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander and all Indigenous peoples across the region attending the summit today. My name is Tanya Stoinoff and I lead government affairs for DXC technology across Australia, New Zealand and the South Pacific. DXC is a global IT services company whose mission is to use the power of technology to build better futures for our customers, colleagues, the environment and our communities. As a leading systems integrator, we respect legacy systems and help them grow and transform for our future needs as a society and as a global community. So transformation and the desire to grow and constantly improve is in our DNA. This session is focused on jobs and skills and what a timely subject. Off the back of the Albanese government's Jobs and Skills Summit that was held earlier this month and the many recommendations that came out of consensus agreement amongst stakeholders, we seek to build a bigger, better trained and more productive workforce. DXC Technology has worked with many universities, TAFEs and other training organisations to build a pipeline of more work-ready graduates to fill the jobs of the future. And we've also worked on reskilling workers from more traditional industry sectors, transitioning them to jobs in IT, project management and even cybersecurity. In the AFR's 2022 annual survey of graduates, DXC was ranked seventh out of Australia's most preferred employers. So we pride ourselves on supporting people as they train and upskill themselves for the future. So now I'd like to introduce our first speaker in this session, my colleague and good friend, Makakama. Thank you, Tanya. My name is Makakama and I'm calling in from Ngunnawal land in the great nation of Australia. And I wish to echo the acknowledgement of traditional owners of country throughout Australia, New Zealand and across the oceans of the South Pacific, including their continuing connection to land and water the oceans and the community. I also extend my respect to all Indigenous people in attendance today, from wherever you're calling in from across the world for today's GAP Summit on Shared Identity. Tongan writer and anthropologist Epeli Haofa provides the context within which today's summit is juxtaposed. He describes the notion of being a Pacific Islander as a common identity that would help us act together for the advancement of our collective interests and for the general good. Whilst the many members of the diverse and island nations of the Pacific retain a fervent pride in their specific national heritage, there's an undoubted common thread between all island descendants, regardless of the island. Pacific Islanders share similar stories, common beliefs, ancient traditions and deep familial structures. We come from all walks of life, from the stereotypical to the fantastical, with many islanders bringing our own island flavor to the rest of the world with great success. Our shared ocean identity is both our common connector and at the same time, our greatest existential threat. Now, more than ever, the islands need the assistance of its perennial allies in Australia and New Zealand and across the world to help transcend these major challenges and overcome these rising tides. As an Australian of Tongan descent, my parents raised me and my siblings in Bathurst, a small country town in New South Wales, Australia. And whilst I had many fond memories of my hometown, I did experience significant racism and prejudice, which reinforced an underlying feeling that I never truly belonged. However, every now and then I would pass by a visiting Pacific Islander in the town and in the street we would, for whatever reason, uh, utter and rehearse the welcome words, uh, hey bro, and in those short moments, I felt more connection with a complete stranger than I did with the people that I'd grown up with my entire life. It sounds really weird, but Pacific Island culture can find a way just to make you feel like you can really belong. As the governor of Bathurst Jail, my late father, Jim Karma, set quite an imposing figure, not just over the prisoners inside the jail, but to anyone else in the local community that wasn't quite doing the right thing. He possessed an undeniable physical presence as a natural result of his specific heritage, but he also equipped himself with the Bachelor of Criminology 
from Charles Sturt University in Bathurst, which formed the foundation of his rise up the ranks of the New South Wales Corrective Services right to the very top. In this way, my father showed me that education was the key, and I understood very early on the value of a solid education for Pacific Islanders to be successful in their career. My father, Jim, was an amazing role model for me, and he showed me that this is an example of what's possible for my own future as a Pacific Island le leader in Australia. And in the late 90s, my father was promoted to governor of Sydney's Park Lee Correctional Centre. And at the time, the then Blacktown Mayor, Charlie Knowles, and the local member, Skills Minister, Ed Husick, asked Governor Karma to create a much needed community diversionary program for youth at nearby Mount Druitt, which was notorious for its high levels of youth crime in Western Sydney. Governor Karma believed that education was the key and that all these kids needed a way to try and find a different way to try and see how they could just finish their homework. And so what he did was he opened the homework centre, which was basically a Hyde community hall, a donated barbecue from Bunnings, sausages and bread from Woolworths, and a group of local Western, University, Western Sydney University students and parents that came together to help kindergarten all the way up to year 12 Mount Druitt students just to finish their homework. Because as long as they were doing that, they weren't running the streets, getting up to trouble. And in the homework centre, kids could spend more time with their parents and they'd be able to socialise with the other parents as well. And those kids would be introduced to local leaders who were examples of what they could become one day. And after completing their homework, they would participate in group activities, learning all about the various cultures from which they came from and which they descended. They could reconnect with their heritage and remind them from where they came from. You see, the challenge for a lot of these kids is that they unfortunately had many of the odds stacked against them just because they were born in a particular place or the colour of their skin or the friends that they had growing up. Along with many others, they found themselves on the wrong side of what is known today as the digital divide, a division causing large parts of the population to miss out on access, education, training, and the opportunities to master the arts of these important digital skills. And the research, it really shows a significant amount of digital exclusion for our First Nations people, people living in rural areas, low-income households, aged Australians, people with disabilities, new migrants and refugees. And as a budding technologist, I learned firsthand about these challenges and set myself out on a mission to try and use technology and inspire leaders to try and find ways to help these underprivileged people. So I took my education and data and my experience in law and I went and worked straight for government to try and see if I could figure out how to take the effects of the homework centre and roll this out at large scale. And along the way, I ended up working for a federal attorney general's department of a, of a minister who's on this call today. Uh, I worked for the Department of Health and Ageing to find ways to scale large digital transformation projects. And throughout that time, I found myself working for various multinational IT consultancies, serving the government, delivering large scale projects and amplifying the positive effects of technology for the benefit of Australia's underprivileged people. And working for these companies, it opened my eyes to the way in which leading IT companies can use their success to give back to the community. And it's been a privilege to be able to work for these organisations none more so than DXC. I joined DXC because of its social impact practice, comprised of programs that focus particularly in areas of society where people often find themselves on the wrong side of the digital divide. DXC has created the Dandelion Program for neurodiverse folks, the Indigenous Programs for Australia's First Nations people and Maori and Pacifica people, so that they can be digitally equipped with co-designed education business, employment and community initiatives, and the Veterans Program, which helps veterans find a way to use their highly attuned out outcomes-driven skills to good use in the IT industry. DXC is also developing new social impact practices for women, a talent academy, and a digital futures program. As a result, I think that DXC has created a significant impact, not just for itself and its own employees, but also for its customers and members of the community to help them build their own social impact practices. 
This is a very direct example of the way that DXC has taken all of its lessons and learnings and impacted society in a positive fashion, but we must do more. At the recent Job Skills Summit hosted by Federal Minister Ed Husick, we set ourselves some key actions to uplift skills and job opportunities for the nation. We agreed that we needed to build bigger and better workforces. We needed to embed women's economic participation and equality as a key imperative. And we needed to reduce these barriers to employment and the advancement so that all Australians could benefit from a strong economy. However, we are asking vulnerable people from the regions to uproot themselves and move to metropolitan centres just to get work. And once again, even though they might become members of those productive areas within which they now live, often the benefit doesn't make its way back to the regions. So for everybody in attendance today, I want you to know that I have a clear vision where we can find ways to use significant technology advances and in infrastructure and together create remote Indigenous and Pacific technology workforces. I can see a Darwin Aboriginal Coding Development Centre. I believe there's now a cybersecurity centre in Bathurst. Perhaps we can create a Tahitian Testing Centre. And in Suva, I'm certain we can create an IT Managed Services Centre. And at these locations, we can establish new homework centres connected to each one of these centres supported by government, private enterprise and local community groups that will work together to make this vision a reality. And with this in mind, I call on all the delegates in attendance today to undertake immediate action for businesses. If you don't already have one, I strongly recommend you create a social impact practice of your own. For governments, please find a way to make this vision a reality and help fund the infrastructure and drive the political political goodwill to achieve what's required. And for citizens, it's really important to remember where you came from. Don't feel disillusioned or despair. It's time for us to really hold on to that optimism. Make sure that we can do more to try and achieve this vision because there are absolutely organizations out there focused on much more than just economic benefit that have a heart and wanna find ways to help our most vulnerable and underprivileged people to be able to grow societies where they are through digital transformation. In conclusion, I wish to leave you with the words of Epele Hau Ofa, that in order to give substance to a common regional identity and animate it, we must tie history and culture to empirical reality and practical action. I truly believe that with such strong representation from key stakeholders uh, in attendance in today's call, we can achieve significant action towards empowering our region's underprivileged peoples by creating digital pathways, homework centres and centres of delivery and help them transcend the digital divide. Thank you. Thank you, Maka. Uh, superb presentation. Um, for those who hadn't had a chance to, to read uh, Maka's background, MACA is actually our managing partner of um, consulting and analytics practice for the federal government in our uh, Canberra office. Uh, he and he's currently completing his PhD thesis on uh, how leaders leverage technology for the benefit of underprivileged people. Um, and he did his studies, econometrics, as he mentioned in his speech at Sydney Uni first and then law at ANU. Um, but look, MACA, thank you so much for your time today and I appreciate the call to action. Um, to the various stakeholder groups on, on this summit today. So thank you for your time. Uh, we'll speak with you soon on the Zoom discussion. Okay, our second speaker today is Toholo Kami, Special Representative for Oceans from the Government of Fiji. Toholo is based in Suva, is a well-respected leader across the Pacific who has led regional organisations, de developmental coalitions and various initiatives across the region. Uh, Tahola was part of Fiji's COP23 team as Special Representative for the Ocean from 2017 to 2020, where he was responsible for creating a dialogue for the ocean within the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. He was also Sherpa for the Fiji PM on the High Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy and Co-Chair of the Pacific Blue Shipping Partnership. He's a Senior Advisor to Neo Toro in developing the Pacifica program and has completed 10 years as head of the International Union for Conservation of Nature in the Oceania office. 
where he established a strong regional program in conservation, sustainable development and high level policy frameworks. A Tongan native, Kami grew up in Papua New Guinea and graduated with an accounting degree from the University of Technology in PNG. He completed an MBA in Marketing Commerce in a Fulbright School of Vanderbilt University. Toholo, over to you. Thank you, and uh, Malolali and Bula um, from New York at this time are here for meetings, but I think the introduction was enough, more than enough. And again, thank you, thank you um, to, our, to um, Maka for leading us off on that and, and uh, doing that really thoroughly. I'm just going to cover a few things from a Pacific perspective and someone who's grown up um, had a little bit of schooling in Australia at the high school level, but grown up very much as an observer of policy and um, and development in this training and skills space, uh, space uh, between the Pacific and um, Australia, and in many ways New Zealand as well, and the approach to this. And so, you know, um, Maka so raised the issue on on some of the challenges with with the for example the labor mobility scheme um we've de depended on on australian scholarships new zealand scholarships and now it's china and everybody else providing high level training um, um and then the the the, the thing the, i think some of the bigger questions to consider is starting to say that as we start to talk about um the pacific family and especially in this time of geopolitics where the language is changing about our relationship, what is Australia's role in the family? And what the, how does this apply to jobs and skills? And, um, and then who are we doing it for? And, um, and so, you know, I, wanna, I just wanna raise a few things here because so much of our partnerships um, in the past, if you look at the intentions are good, but often the outcome is extractive. And um, while there are short-term benefits, um, the challenge of shifting to Australia um, for short-term, the short-term, even the longer-term, it also means that you're leaving behind communities um, that can't do basic things anymore um, in terms of agriculture, in terms of even just keeping a soccer team or a rugby team going. These basic things that hold communities together um, are no longer possible. We just, everyone uh, gets on this train that there's these opportunities in Australia. And so this, this, this challenge of getting this right. And so one of them is recognized. So I just want to bring up some points for further discussion, but one is recognize the benefits for integration and partnership moving forward. And what should this look like? And is it just this thing like, oh, that's a great idea. The leaders have asked for it. Here's a $200 million package to train uh, Pacific Islanders with skills. And then the question starts to become, can we, is there integration and is there partnership in the long run if we continue to hold up uh, other issues that are just as important? So things like one is the, the issue of scale and training. And, and are we doing enough or are we doing just enough to fill the gaps that Australia has? And uh, for everything from training plumbers to training people who are who can uh, pick fruit and uh, all the other things that we know, even our highest skilled people. And there's a certain point where you start to say, do we need to look at other areas such as access, um, um, access between our countries, not just about a barrier on how Pacific Islanders get into Australia, but start to challenge the issue and start to say, what does family look like here? And is this a, a one-way relationship where we're given something and then if possible, we're trained to be able to feed a gap in the Australian economy and sometimes fill something that we have here in the Pacific. So talking to a local businessman in Fiji last week, and he just said, look, I'm bringing people in from Bangladesh now. My best people have moved to Australia. And uh, he says, my friend is bringing uh, another 20 people from Bangladesh because we can't just find the local skills here anymore. And so the question starts to come up about what's the, how do we start to deal with partnership here? And, um, and can we do this without starting to look at the special relationship between Pacific Islanders 
and Australia and start to say, for example, uh, can we remove international fees for training? And it's reciprocal in terms of Australians coming into the Pacific, Pacific Islanders coming to Australia. If you remove the international fees, I guarantee many Pacific families will make the loans, even though it's more than they can afford most times, but they'll make the loans and they'll send their kids to get trained properly. You couldn't get better champions for the benefits of Australia if they're coming through your systems. At the same time, they maintain these strong connections home. You start to say with professional training, what if our doctors had as much access into Australia? And when we have gaps, Australian doctors have access into our systems. And what can we do more? And I'm just using that as an example about starting to say, what could partnership look like if we start to look at what, what long-term integration would mean? Um, and if we're Pacific Island four or four member countries, what does that what what should that be uh, moving forward? Um, this whole issue of recipro reciprocity um, that the benefits are not just for us. Australia benefits too. But over time, when you look at a lot of the assistance, it's got to go from extractive to the mutual benefit and start to ask the deeper questions of where do we start to say, the Pacific Island relationship is important enough that it's different from Asia. It's different from other countries that often it comes back in the policy. You're going, wow, it's easier for the Chinese to access the school than it is for Pacific Islanders. Even though the, rhetor the rhetoric and the narrative is always like we have a special relationship with the Pacific. And I think we've got to start to ask the deeper questions is what does that look like in terms of access? And then what does that look like in terms of investment? And then what kind of outcome do we want by, say, 2030 and by 2050? And that we have this freedom of movement between our countries and that these gaps can be fulfilled by the fact that someone in Australia can sit there and say, hey, I'd like to help out in Tonga or in Papua New Guinea, because these are things that we like to do. And it's not just the other way, or not just a, a one-way track here. So I'm not going to take this any further. I think some of the things that I've raised here uh, is recognize the true benefits of integration and partnership. We wouldn't be trying to play catch up now if we've got this right. And we wouldn't be trying to, we, it wouldn't be a geopolitical competition out there between Australia and others. Um, if we had got this right in the first place. The other question is to ask, has the traditional investment in the Pacific, which often comes out when we read your politics, that it's almost like you're doing us a bigger favor. Oh, we've just extended our, our, our um, aid package. The, then you start to look at the relationship. And the question now we're asking is, did, you, did Australia invest enough? after all the impacts that you've had on a, in terms of colonizing and all the benefits that Australian companies have had from investing and taking the best of our resources and then starting to say, yeah, um, has, it, has there been enough investment in this, uh, in, uh, since independence for many of our countries? We've got to ask the tough questions on partnership. We've got to talk honestly about it. Sometimes our leaders don't bring these things to the table because there are certain protocols, there are certain things that happen in terms of diplo speak. But you ask the question now, if we got this right, we wouldn't have the kind of geopolitical competition that we have in trying to get the attention of our Pacific leaders. So I'll stop there. Um, I think there will be more to come, but I'm looking forward to some questions as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Tahala, all the way from New York City as well. We really thank you for your time uh, and we'll speak with you soon on the Zoom discussion as well. Thank you. Our third speaker this session is Dr. George Carter, Research Fellow in Geopolitics and Regionalism from the Department of Pacific Affairs at ANU. George is also the director for the ANU Pacific Institute, a network hub of over 200 scholars connecting and promoting Pacific studies research, teaching and training at the university. He lectures courses in international relations, diplomacy, security, environment and climate change, policy, cross-cultural communication and Pacific studies. 
George attained his PhD from ANU, having completed a Masters of Arts in International Relations with Honours and a Masters of Diplomacy as an Australian Awards Scholar. Subsequently, he received the Prime Minister's Australia Pacific Award and the SSGM DPA Pacific Scholarship for his doctoral studies. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and Pacific Studies from Victoria University of Wellington. Prior to coming to Australia for studies, he was the political advisor at the US Embassy in Apia. George's research and teaching interests are informed by his education, work experience in the Pacific and upbringing through his proud Samoan, Tuvaluan and Ikarabati Chinese and British ancestry. He serves his family and village in Samoa where he holds the Matai chiefly title of Sala. Over to you, George. Maroso ifua malalangi ma fa fai mole ni ba no fa au fa ye fa soa tu ta tu por kala mi talo fa talo falava talo fa maori. I'd like to acknowledge and pay tribute to the traditional owners from the Nanawal and Gambri land. I'm currently here in Canberra at the Australian National University. I would like to pay tribute to the elders past and emerging, as well as acknowledging all First Nations and Indigenous um, who are on this online platform. But more importantly, my leaders, as well as um, colleagues who are joining us uh, from uh, the Pacific, or as if my friend uh, Taholo in uh, New York were able to be a part of this uh, important summit. Thank you for the opportunity to share. Now, the theme of this second conference on small states is shared identity. And I found this uh, the main reason why I wanted to come about and share some thoughts in this. While it is on the area of jobs and skills, um, I believe in this theme of shared identity as something profound, for it will trigger and has triggered uh, many uh, innovations and also ways forward in terms of relationship between Australia and the rest of the Pacific. Now, my first caveat here is that I'm not, this, I'm not going to provide a list of jobs and skills. Um, I think our learned colleagues, uh, the economists and the entrepreneurs within our congregation online will probably provide this in, uh, in through our conversations. However, I rather would like to focus uh, my reflection on this journey of building or constructing a shared identity that is between Australia and the Pacific Islands by highlighting from my research, the trends, the lessons learned from history and the contemporary, the challenges and opportunities, because I feel like this will help us think deeper about the jobs and skills in this current endeavor. More importantly, uh, my current my new sort of area of research around just transitions. We are at that crossroad of post-COVID-19, the need to um, create, uh, move from uh, fossil fuel to low carbon development economies is an area where I'm fascinated in, in terms of what these economies would look like for the Pacific. Um, and as a researcher raised and educated in the Pacific, I feel like I'm very privileged to work and uh, research here in Australia. I'm also like to say the other privilege that we have here is that we are uh, through this panel, we're only showing sort of male uh, views and that we do not have a, a, a women in our um, panel. But that is also another view that we need to uh, take on board. But here, this privilege of being educated in Australia, um, that uh, this research, I hope, brings Australia along with the Pacific not Australia leading the Pacific, but uh, that is, works along the Pacific. I believe in research that um, they contribute to the Pacific, but also what Australia can learn from the Pacific. Now these thoughts complement uh, what economic statistics and traditions will say in terms of uh, uh, our thinking in research and policy. But I'd like to, if anything that you take away from uh, my thoughts here is the importance of context, culture, well-being, environment, the climate, and relationships when we think about jobs and skills for Australia and our work in the Pacific. Now, at the offset, shared identity is something not new. This endeavor has been part of the Canberra Pact 
uh, when we saw in 1944 the South Pacific Commission established through technical cooperation. We saw this in the Pacific Islands in the formation in 1971 through political security and the ideas around the Pacific Way. We see this in our um, regional architecture where Australia and New Zealand are a part of and through the latest uh, Blue Pacific, the 2050 strategy that tells us the way forward for the Pacific. It's important that this shared vision is a part of that, uh, takes into account, works alongside, complements these uh, visions of the Pacific, not uh, creating new ones that do not acknowledge and walk away. That by thinking about the shared jobs, uh, I hope that we also take into account that we do have a shared geography and history. We have shared vulnerabilities and that we have an opportunity and responsibility from shared learning and solution. So shared geography and history, we know that this region, uh, you know, and the people who uh, occupy uh, are proud navigators who have come through through conquest, but also through cooperation have led to uh, many different civilizations. And part of this, we see it in today. Um, during the times of colonialism, uh, we saw that Pacific peoples were brought into uh, Australia to fill uh, jobs and skills through the plantation economies um, in the colonies, as well as the Commonwealth in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Now we see a reincarnation of that through the labor mobility program, uh, which we see as of today. It's important that we learn from this history, what came out of it and the need. Uh, there are some questions that we need to think about in today that uh, while we're catering to Australia's labor shortage in agriculture, we are also not playing fair in terms of the Pacific's labor shortage. As uh, Taholo has mentioned, I also heard this in the last few months when I was in Fiji, the word B, brain drain, was being uh, not just written within the policy documents, but uh, pronounced. People were saying that we are feeling the effect of brain drain from this labor mobility. So are we thinking about, um, how much are we thinking about in terms of working with the Pacific in these program? And how much are we thinking about the care programs and the reintegration of Pacific peoples to return to the islands to work in this? In the area of shared vulnerabilities, it's important that we take into consideration the impact of climate change. We know that the youth bulge, uh, in main, mainly in Melanesia, impacts us all in terms of our work and the need to uh, uh, make sure that uh, we alleviate uh, these economies. Uh, these are just some of the many uh, vulnerabilities that there are, including natural disasters. We need to take into our shared vision, take heed of these vulnerabilities, that these are not just opportunities for Australia, but we need to strengthen and empower island countries and communities. The jobs and skills should meet the vulnerabilities of youth bulge, threats of climate change, but they also need to be contextualized based on island cultures and also about the questions around sustainability. Now, in terms of shared learning and solutions, as I've said, we need to take into account the recent 2050 strategy of the Blue Pacific. The countries have identified seven pillars. We need to complement uh, these shared priorities, not creating new ones, work on these visions that support Australia, but at the same time, empower the Pacific. Education, part of the um, part of the education sector, we need more and more investment in this area. We've heard uh, from Taholo and others the need for greater opportunities for Pacific people to be educated in our universities. But I would like to say we need to go more. We need to see Pacific researchers inside Pacific universities. They not just have to be there as researchers or teachers. They need to be the leaders. Uh, our Pacific population and diaspora needs to envision and see people in leadership. Part of that are in uh, government, but also within um, uh, our universities. It's not just important that we learn about the Pacific, we also need to have people from the Pacific in these, in these places. At the same time, we need to cater for our diaspora. They are the link between Australia and the Pacific. How much are we investing in opportunities on e-commerce? Uh, or opportunities that link our uh, economies here and the trade from the Pacific that cater for the diaspora. And of course, I'd like to finish again, going coming back to uh, trust transitions. 
COVID has meant that our countries closed their borders. It showed their resilience, but they can, but their systems can also survive. However, the systems uh, also need regional and international integration. And this is where we can come through in terms of our thinking and our work in policy research uh, around uh, jobs and skills. Just transitions means moving away from fossil fuel economies and low carbon development. But are we ready with the jobs and the skills that meet some of what would say people-centered development that the Pacific have been pushing, which means jobs that are for community, that are uh, for community-based initiatives and priorities that incorporate traditional and local knowledge and institutions that are also nature-based solutions, jobs that are not just land-based, but also for the ocean. Um, these are just some reflections. I hope that uh, it will help us in our thinking as we move into the next session of Atala Noa about thinking more deeper about jobs and skills uh, in our shared uh, identity. After. Thank you for your presentation, George. Uh, and thank you to all of our previous speakers in this session. Uh, it's been my pleasure and privilege to be your chair for this uh, session today. I'd like to thank all our sponsors and our organisers, the fabulous team at Global Access Partners. Um, I thank my company, DXC Technology, for continuing their support of this organisation. And also uh, we thank the OECD. I now invite you all to join our Zoom discussion with our speakers. You can do that by clicking on Back to Virtual Lobby in the top left-hand corner of your screen. Once in the virtual lobby, click on the Zoom discussion red button at the top of the screen. And we ask you to please keep the virtual lobby page open at all times in your browser as well. Thank you again.